Good morning, everybody. How's my sound? Is it good? All right. Well, welcome to Clean Lakes Alliance. Uh, first of the year, Yahara Lakes 101 Lake Science Cafe. First one of the year, and I just heard somebody say, this is one great crowd, is it not? You know, 8 o'clock in the morning, give yourselves a hand for, for clean water. I'm Bob Weber. I'm president of First Weber here in Madison and around the state of Wisconsin, and a member of the Clean Lakes Alliance board. And I also have with me a friend of Clean Lakes from First Weber in the back, Ann Cardinelli. And I just want to share, we are proud to be a sponsor of this event and for our participation in Clean Lakes Alliance and all the things that are happening to try to improve the condition of our bodies of water here in the Yarra River watershed. So we appreciate that. And I also want to share a hosting sponsor as well who are part of this event, and that would be the Edgewater, the University of Wisconsin Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, uh, and media partner, the Isthmus, and supporting sponsor, Johnson Bay. And a couple of quick announcements. I think I have a little housekeeping here. One is, don't forget, if you're not following this, Frozen Assets, it's coming right up. It's Clean Lakes Alliance's large, family-friendly festival. Uh, it's only three weeks away, and that would be February 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. I'd be surprised if anyone in this room isn't aware, but if you're not, check it out. Uh, if you don't know a lot about it, there's people in the room you could ask and learn more today. Um, you all have flyers at your seats, so don't miss... Uh, all the free activities that go along with that. There's a Friday night bike race on a lit course on the lake, a new 5K run, run walk Saturday morning, held entirely on the lake, so that's a little tidbit of what those festivities are. And then back to Yahara Lakes 101. We have an exciting lineup this year covering topics ranging from invasive species to fish reproduction. So it's an exciting, an exciting group of topics here. Today, though, We'll be learning about the UW Center for Lyme Mineralogy's most recent research involving the lakes and streams in our watershed. And here to in introduce our speaker is from Johnson Bank, Vice President, Clean Lakes Alliance Friends Board member, Colleen Johnson. Good morning, everyone. Yes, it is a little warmer out. We're enjoying that, isn't it? Great. Um, but don't worry, there is a, a chill in the air. We need the uh, nice cold weather for our frozen acid event that uh, Bob was just talking about. So uh, if you haven't heard about it, there's lots of information here uh, online. Check it out. Um, at Johnson Bank, we have a number of volunteers that are excited to help out for the day's event, as well as attending the dinner and uh, social event for the evening. So great event, good fundraiser, good cause. Uh, as Bob said, I'm Colleen Johnson. And I'm a financial advisor with Johnson Bank, Johnson Financial. And uh, we've been a proud sponsor for years of the Clean Lakes. So it's, uh, it's my, my privilege and opportunity to, uh, to present to you our, uh, introduce to you our speaker today. So today's speaker is Dr. Paul Robbins, director of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin. The Nelson Institute is a world-renowned Institute that addresses glo rapid global environmental change. Dr. Robbins works to strengthen commitment to the Wisconsin idea through expansion of innovative service learning and internship programs, partnerships across campus, and community programs and public events. Dr. Robbins has experience, years of experience as a researcher, educator, specializing in human interactions with nature and the politics of natural resource management. He is a Madison UW alumni with a bachelor's degree in anthropology and holds a master's degree and doctorate in geography, both from Clark University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Robbins. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks to everybody. Uh, thanks to Bob and Colleen and thanks to the Clean Lakes Alliance. Uh, three acknowledgments before I begin. One, uh, the city of Madison and the University of Wisconsin occupied Blue Chunk land of which they have known since time immemorial as Dijot, named for our lakes. Uh, I'd like to credit them with a lot of the work they're doing to remediate waterways around the state in partnership with the state of Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, and hopefully with the Clean Lakes Alliance moving forward. Second acknowledgement, I cannot believe how many people are here at 8 o'clock in the morning. I have spent most of my career in academia. Do you know what it takes to get an 18-year-old to an 8 o'clock class? So I would urge you all to enroll in the University of Wisconsin classes and fill our 8 a.m. slots as much as possible. 
The third thing I'd like to acknowledge is that I know next to nothing about water in environments like Wisconsin. I've spent my entire career working in arid ecosystems in India and throughout the U.S. Southwest. So the, the, the advantage of this is that if we want to deliver a lecture in lay terms, the best person you could get is somebody who's pretty ignorant on the topic. <laughs> and that's me. But what I do know a great deal about is about the University of Wisconsin, um, both as an alum and somebody who has now worked here for six years. I understand its strengths and the beauty of its model in the Wisconsin idea. And that's what I want to talk about today. The thing that makes its water research, resource research different than almost any other institution I've been involved in, in the way it partners, its vision for education, and how it manages its entanglements with public authorities, private firms, and the general public. Because it's magic. You've got something really magic here. Otherwise, I quit years ago. So um, with that in mind, I, I want to say that um, growing up in Denver, Colorado, which is where I grew up, we had water rationing as early as 1976. There were these little, there were these little um, calendars that you would get uh, in the mail, and they had red circles and green squares and um, blue triangles or something like that, and you had, you had to water every third day. And after a while, people would actually rat on each other if their neighbors were watering on the off day. So, you know, I, knew, I, I, was, I, was definitely, I definitely grew up in a world of water scarcity. So when I came to school here in 1985, and I looked out my dorm window, at all these damn lakes, I said, what the hell are these people doing? They just leave their water lying around. <laughs> I came to take advantage of the lakes during my time here um, because it really was, it was just like being able to just jump in. I, I could, could just jump into the water. And um, it was magic and it's never left me. So when I returned six years ago to run the institute, is this too loud? It sounds really loud to me. Is it good? When I came back here six years later, I, uh, the magic was still there. You could still see the lakes. Sometimes you could even get in them on a good day in the right place. I became remarkably sensitized to how impaired the streams, rivers, and lakes of Wisconsin are. And it moved me to the brink of tears, such that I figured I really do have to learn something about water resources in an environment that is not only wet, but I can tell you, as I'll say for the final slides, it's going to get a lot wetter which is a blessing that you folks have no idea about, unless you lived out west. Uh, I mean, take a look at what's happening out west. Or a curse, depending on how we manage for the future. So that's, that's my preamble. Oh yeah, I got this. My second piece of the preamble is this. So I'll be talking about more than the knowledge today. I'll, I'll, be t I'll only be touching on the knowledge folks. I'm going to go 10,000 feet across the whole campus just to give you a feel of how the university approaches water resource research and outreach. But I thought I'd start with this. I start almost every lecture with this. This is a Pew Research poll. It is done every year to determine public priorities. So what are the most, what's most important to the public? And you will notice that the environment, it's not the top of the list exactly. I can tell you where climate change fits. It's right down here above transportation. Um, so that's where the public sits on this. And what I want to say about that, I know we're all shaking our heads. I run an environmental unit, so of course, like that's, I'm just thinking job security, right? But the truth is, people have better things on their mind. They're upset. They have got the economy, they've got jobs, they've got health care, they've got the poor and needy, they have all of these things on their minds before they have the environment. And what I want to say about that is that those things are all environmental. Those things all rest. The economy, as Gaylord Nelson says, or said, is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. So if you start where people live, which is up here, you will get them to the environment. If you start with the environment every time, there's time to start with the environment. If you start with the environment every time, you're not going to get them there. And the Clean Lakes Alliance knows that. That's the other thing I've learned over the last few years. That to get people to pony up for the lakes, whoever that is, whether that's interest in real estate or people who live down the block, doesn't matter. They've got to care about the lakes. They have to use them. They have to get out on them. And one of the first things you have to do is make them recognize that all the other things, the things that there are many of these other things that they're worried about are about the environment. All right? The second thing is, those are the two 2017 priorities, right? is that you can move the needle. This is 2016. So the environment managed to hopscotch the budget deficit, the military, and tax reforms. 
right, within one year. Now, this bounces around from year to year. I can warn you about it, but you can move the needle. So this is the first thing I want to say about UW, Madison. It is a center for research and education, but its key power is that it, on a good day, the Wisconsin idea is about listening to communities first. What do communities care about? What's important to them? And you can deliver back ways to work with them around things that you think are important, like clean legs, to be transformative across the board. That's, that is the, that, this is the potential. Climate change, we have other ways to go on. So, I'm going to give you 10,000 foot flight and a billion examples of research going on, but I want you to keep these three things in mind. That what makes the university different than many, or most of the universities I've worked at, is one, that its science is typically geared to be decision ready. That doesn't mean you do science, you write a paper, and you dump it on a community or on the DNR. It means you start by listening to the problems and the challenges of the community, return to the basic science, which is your job, and nuance some productive relationship so that all that work doesn't gather dust. That is definitely the Wisconsin idea, and I tell you that three times out of five, that's exactly what happens on campus. Second, the UW Madison is based on nodes and networks. That is, the people of Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin, and the University of Wisconsin invest in nodes of research. That means they buy faculty. That is a good thing to do. They train students. That is a good thing to do. That is money into the silo, whatever silo that is. Whether that is groundwater hydrology, whether that is limnology, you have to invest and you have to pay for that expertise. But if you stop there, you cannot deliver decision ready science. And that's because you also have to invest in a network that is to connect those nodes, and all the examples I'm going to provide you have tasted of this. Connect those nodes of research with constituencies in the public, with our partners at the DNR with the Clean Lakes Alliance, with whoever else it is. And those networks cost money too, I just want to say. That's why the university is littered with interdisciplinary centers, more than I can count. It is the most anarchic campus I have ever worked on. There's a center for everything, and that's good, because it means that people are investing their time not merely in reproducing excellent science in civil and, uh, and environmental engineering, but connecting it to Sea Grant or those other kinds of institutions to build out. Third, the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and uh, many of our partner campuses are different because they start from community identified problems. I'll give you some examples of that here, that if you listen to the community first and do the science second, you're going to be better off than doing the science than trying to figure out what community can use it. That's like shooting a shotgun in the dark in a crowded room. Not a good metaphor, but you see my point. That it's just it's not the way to go about things. If you listen first, it's both more efficient and more effective, and you're much more likely to move the needle from environment at 38% to 45%. All right. So that's those are the three lessons. I want you to keep those in mind. And now I'm just going to give you a parade of examples of work at the UW. And I hope that almost every example I provide here, which is connected with a faculty member, a faculty and research uh, uh, team of students, has already been here to tell you what you already know. You'll see the spiny water flea. You all know that. You'll see legacy phosphorus in sediments. We all know about that. You're not going to learn anything new here. What I want you to feel is the breadth and the power of the institution, which I believe is also still underutilized. OK, let's roll. So I do want to also credit the depth of history here. And um, this, is, this is worth remembering that uh, UW is basically the original water campus. It remains the water <laughs> campus. A little history lesson for those of you who are interested in this, right? The knowledge was invented here. The knowledge was created at UW Madison. Edward Burge was hired as a zoologist in 1875, right? And went straight to work with um, some of his colleagues, including Chauncey Jude in, in 1908. And they worked for 40 years on characterizing freshwater ecosystems, which would be known as later as ecosystems, but now just lakes, especially comparative, especially up in this latitude. This is a breakthrough, like studying lakes as, as a unique system. Whoops. There he is. OK, so this is Edward Burge, 1875. Arthur Hasler, who was a student of theirs, returns to UW Madison in 1937. So the idea of ecosystems is, is catching fire at this time and reinvented that program to emphasize experimental approaches, which included the manipulation of whole lakes. I think this is important, because I think we need to recognize 
that these lakes are engineered systems upon which we have a lot of influence, but we have often little control. As such, an experimental approach, which is some of what we'll be seeing here, is essential. In the Anthropocene, that is the age of human domination of, in the environment more broadly, we have to admit that we are imperfect managers, but inevitable managers of things like the Ahara Lake system. I mean, we control those locks and dams. We just can't control the rainfall. All right. Third, water chemistry. Water chemistry was also pioneered here. G. Fred Lee started the first and only graduate program in water chemistry in 1962. It's now known as environmental chemistry and technology. I think it was renamed probably in the early 2000s. But water chemistry was developed here. It was, it was born here. Oh, I keep trying to get away from history. Let me go back. Groundwater hydrology, which I studied in graduate school. I thought it only applied to arid ecosystems. Uh, apparently, it came from Madison. Um, uh, this goes back to T.C. Chamberlain, actually, all the way in the 1800s. Uh, T.C. Chamberlain was working on groundwater hydrology uh, before the turn of the 20th century. Uh, water engineering, Daniel Mead, who was a consulting engineer at the time, became head of the Department of Hydraulic and Sanitary Engineering in 1904. This is the water campus. Don't let anybody tell you different. Okay, so that's, it starts here. All right. And it comes into fluor inflorescence everywhere on campus. This is part of the anarchy, the problem of hurting all these cats. Sure, it's civil and environmental engineering, and sure, it's uh, applied in uh, agricultural economics and environmental chemistry and technology, but we have folks in American Indian Studies. We just did a hire in English. She's a rhetorician who is an expert on dam removal. So I guess if you do what she came to us from the East Coast, I guess if you do water, you just if the watershed just flows towards UW Madison. So this is a very a, a very widespread network. The problem is that makes it quite anarchic and hard to understand. Like if you if you really want to talk, that's a that's an overview of the talk. Just keep going. So one of the first efforts that I want to describe here is a way that the faculty on campus have tried to create a front door for water at UW. Because if you're interested in water problems, you don't know who to talk to. It's just like whoever you know. Like, OK, call Ken Potter, right? That's what I'd do. If I had a water question, I'd just call Ken Potter. He's retired. But you know that would be my front door. But somebody else would say, well, I know somebody from a project when we work with Ho-Chunk in, in American Indian Studies. Let's call her. Or let's go call. This is a huge problem for the UW Madison. What is the front door? Where can you really get an overview? And Water at UW is a, is a nascent effort to do this. The goal is to facilitate communication and collaboration among the UW-Madison community, but also uh, beyond. And some very powerful scientists, including, including uh, Steve Lohai, are in charge here. But you can see colleges across the campus, degree programs from across the campus, departments, research centers, and our partners in DNR, USGS, uh, across the system campuses. This is really hard. This is the hurting cats part, and it has to be invested in. You have to build this network if you're going to know what to do. So if you do have questions, and you do want to know more about water at UW, there's a website, there's a, there's a director, and it can get you out. If you have a question, it can be farmed out into different directions. That's a bit of an innovation at UW-Madison. Uh, companies tell me the same problem. I, I, I'll ask Bob and our friends from the private sector, if you wanted to go and talk to UW about something, who would you talk to? There's like the Office of Corporate Relations, there's the Office of Industrial Relations, there, right? There's like three or four. Um, the chancellor's trying to, again, herd these cats together. This is an effort to do this in, in water, and a laudable one at that. And its activities are um, numerous. They have a, a newsletter that you can get. Uh, they hold a research symposium every year that's open to the public. Uh, they assist uh, potential graduate students in picking graduate programs, because there's a dozen that you can, you can uh, you can go through at the University of Wisconsin, and at trying to develop a story map that highlights water on campus, kind of like what I'm trying to do today, but probably better informed. All right, 10,000, staying at 10,000 feet. Let's just talk a little bit about, actually, let's talk a little bit about some work that comes out of low high lab in greater detail. So one of the things that uh, is represented in that big, um, under that big umbrella is work on uh, groundwater systems, especially in this uh, shallow aquifer that we have here. So one of the things that makes Wisconsin interesting is its geologic history. Uh, unlike the uh, aquifers that I knew and studied in Arizona that are confined aquifers that sit under an impervious layer, right, of material, where you, you, know, you dig a deep well, there's very little interaction between that system and the surface, like what's going on where people live. But Wisconsin couldn't be any more different. 
So this is some examples of research that show you where some basic science can change the way we manage the land and benefit communities in fundamental ways. I'll give you this example. Sandy soils. How, where do these sandy soils come from? Right? We're at Glacier Lake, Wisconsin, central part of the state. We're at the sand counties of, of, of fame. Um, uh, beyond that, the glacial period, and before that, actually, being on the shores of a great Cambrian Sea. So we got a lot of sand, right? And that means that water filters very quickly through those systems and drains out of them, which means a brief drought, of which I can tell you there will be more in the future, can wind up with terrific impacts, especially on forest ecosystems, because you're not replenishing that surface aquifer. A shallow aquifer is very, very good. Not too high, but not too low. So the Low High Lab is working very closely on simulating drought conditions. This is a graduate student creating a drought in a, in a very small area. Try to understand what happens in that saturation of that soil and the relationship between the groundwater, raising and lowering that groundwater level, the sensitivity of different kinds of vegetative communities. Huge question for economic forestry, huge question, as I'll show you, for agriculture, and fundamental and unique to the state of Wisconsin is this research that reaches out and touches Wisconsin resource management. This is all in the rubric of water AUW. I'll give you another example, urban eco-hydrology. People around the city are doing all kinds of weird experiments, right? Experiments in rain gardening, experiments in changing where their drain, their downspout comes off of their roof. You know, in the city of Cleveland, until recently, it was illegal to take your downspout out of the sewage system, right? Because you know, they were worried about, I don't know what they were worried about. These laws were written in 1890 or whatever, right? What that means is that every time it rains in Cleveland, you get a combined sewer overflow, right, into Lake Erie. You wind up with, you wind up with poo in the lake, yes. So they changed that law recently, but what, but what we don't know is when 10,000 or 1,000 or 500 residents change their downspout decisions, water garden, change the way they manage their landscaping, change what they're growing on their landscape, we have no idea how that aggregates at a system level in urban ecology in terms of groundwater versus surface water flow. We don't know. It would take somebody really smart to figure it out. That's what the university's for, right? To answer those kinds of questions, to reinform basic questions that people in the public have. What should I be doing on my property? And the answer right now is on some of these things, we don't know. Right? Where do you get the most bang for your buck? It's all good. You should all go do good, go home and do good things. But some of the good things you do probably don't have as big an effect as others, right? Other work out of the low high lab. Third, agroecosystems, food security. Again, in the central sands, but also throughout the state. The thing about, again, this unique hydrology of the state is that if you get a lot of water in the system really quickly, which will happen in the future, you're going to get raised groundwater levels right there in the zone where you're growing your food. If you have a drought, even a, not even a prolonged drought, you're going to get a decrease of saturation out of that zone. Now, what if you could, heaven forfend, engineer or manage with wells the levels of water at a kind of precision agricultural level so that you could move that water around, not overdraw it when it's unnecessary to overdraw it, or draw it when it's necessary to draw it down. To make those decisions, you'd have to know a lot more than you do right now. So there are farmers throughout the state who are extremely interested in what the Low High Lab is doing. Improve food security by understanding better what happens in this very fascinating puzzle of a shallow aquifer. Follow me? Final one, protecting fence. We have all of these terrific uh, wetlands throughout the state, and they're incredibly sensitive, especially again in this shallow aquifer condition, to changes in water level. And we know, and I'm going to come to this at the end, that climate change is going to impact the frequency and intensity of precipitation. So if we're going to protect these wetlands, we can't, it's not good enough just to put a fence around them and say, all right, we're not going to develop. That is actually the first step. Protect the, the wetlands. The second step is figure out all the things that impinge on them from outside. Some of that works going on at the arboretum. So, Water UW, an interdisciplinary community, this is an example of work that goes on under that broad umbrella. Next slide. The Aquatic Sciences Center. That's uh, James Hurley directing here. What the Sciences Center does is it basically hosts Sea Grant and the Water Resources Institute, which is, when I say basically, like that's, the, that's a huge story. And it deserves, have we had him in? Have we had him in? Yeah. Bring him in. So this is, this is Great Lakes work. These are, there are almost 40 projects going on. They are, it is a, a terrific example of how to keep federal and state money 
judiciously balanced with commitments from uh, the university and from universities around the state, right? Sea Grant is a, is a shared entity and an institution. If you think the University of Wisconsin-Madison is disorganized within itself, imagine the relationship between Madison and Milwaukee. Regrettably disorganized. Don't, is the press here? <laughs> it's not a secret. So especially on water, there's a lot of cooperation between individual faculty. Faculty are gregarious and friendly. But institutionally, it's much harder to kind of get over these boundaries. Sea Grant is an example of an institutional incentive to hold the community together, right? To get uh, organized uh, around big questions, especially around healthy coastal ecosystems, fisheries, and a lot of the things you see here. So a lot of the Great Lakes work, in fact, which I do not have time to summarize here, is coming out of this cooperative center. Now, does this center reside in any of the colleges? Here's the genius, right? No. It sits with the Vice Chancellor for Research. Wow, inside baseball. What I mean is, it doesn't live in agriculture, it doesn't live in LMS, letters and science, it doesn't live in engineering, but it, it draws on and feeds all of them to try to, to, to manage our decision making around the Great Lakes and uh, the larger uh, community water systems. That's the Wisconsin idea in action. It's not just Madison, it's the whole system. Stevens Point is a partner here, all right? Okay. Do we have Stevens Point graduates in the room? You learn, you learn about central sands, agriculture, and high capacity well drilling. Go ask our brothers and sisters at Stevens Point. I have nothing to say on this. One of the first talks I gave when I got here is I said something about that, and the phone rang off the hook for two months. <laughs> I am going to talk about the Center for Limnology, however. I don't want to leave that uh, out. Jake Van Der Zanden, who you must have had speak here, uh, who is just magical, is, uh, is the lead here. But of course, this is the legacy of all the people I, I said before, including Steve Carpenter, who I didn't mention. Um, this is a, a terrific unit. I think we're all pretty familiar with what it's supposed to do. I want to show you two projects that you're already probably familiar with, but it is where a lot of time and attention are going, and with good reason. The first, there we go, is this Finding Water Fleet, right? Discovered in 2009 in this lake, Lake Mendota. This Finding Water Fleet's claim to fame, although it has all important ecosystem functions, wherever it, the hell it came from, in this lake system, its, uh, its overbearing power is to consume Daphnia. Uh, Daphnia, of course, a really important part of the indigenous um, system to the lake. This is one of the great metabolic engines that cycles that nutrient uh, load and, and brings down and or increases water clarity. All right? that's, that, that's not Daphnia's job. Daphnia's job is to stay alive, reproduce, and expand. But in the process, it produces ecosystem services that we like. And the spiny water fleet has, um, has, as I'll show you, been responsible for a decline in lake clarity of something on the order of a half a meter. So if your job, like the Clean Lakes Alliance, is to remediate the water system, to save the lakes, your job just got it like twice as hard. It's now, you know, a hundred million dollars more expensive to do the thing you were doing already. And I think it also emphasizes something that we got to get our head around. Even though we're engineering these lakes, we have no idea what surprises come down the line. Nobody predicted uh, the spiny water fleet in 2002. This is just the beginning of a range of surprises which can be attended also and relate, related to climate change in the region. Increased temperatures and increased precipitation. So I don't want to say that the spiny water fleet was caused by climate change. It wasn't. I want to say it was a surprise and we're not done. Second, not so surprise. Oh, there you go. To regain three feet of water clarity, you need to reduce phosphorus loading by 70%. Okay, so that's a big setback for the Clean Lakes goals, which were already set prior to 2009. Isn't that correct? Yeah, yeah, so good luck with that. All right, there's $100 million. I can find that. I can find $100 million. Okay, I can't find $100 million. Zebra mussels were discovered in the lake in 2015, not as surprising. One of the interesting features about the zebra mussel, which I'm only learning from Jake, is that not only right are they kind of a, all kinds of problems, one of the things they do is they move the nutrient load or spread the nutrient load around. So instead of coming from the body of the lake as a whole, now we see them uh, on, now we see nutrient loads on the bottom, right, where the, where the zebra mussel grows and lives, and you get a lot more activity down there, which means mats of algae coming from whole new places and washing ashore for all kinds of beach closures. There's a major contribution 
of the zebra mussel right there for to exacerbating an already existing problem. The fundamental problem is obviously still phosphorus loading. It is still basically driven by things going into the lake, but the zebra mussel is going to make it that much harder. Um, there are places where the zebra mussel clears the water column. I don't want to, let's not, let's not beat up on, these are, these are smart species. Maybe they can help us. But I'm not sure how in this case. Um, I think the only way out of this, right, is phosphorus related. My point here is this is two projects that are clearly not only interdisciplinary, but uh, reside in the, uh, the, the limnology lab, but also, of course, reach across, are based on problem solving, are linked to the goals of the Clean Lakes Alliance. It is the UW Madison, Wisconsin idea in action. Let's keep going. How am I doing for time? Oh, I thought I would thought I had a lot more time. Green Lake, let's talk about Green Lake. When I first said we were doing interdisciplinary work at Green Lake, somebody said, why? There's nothing but wealthy people living around the lake up there. Okay, the answer, the answer actually is it's one of the great puzzles in the state of Wisconsin. Green Lake is 237 feet deep. It's the deepest lake in the state. That means it's got all kinds of complicated uh, anoxic uh, problems at certain levels of the lake. We don't know fully how the lake works. We're used to these nice shallow glacial lakes, so it's a great puzzle. But I'm, as a, as a political ecologist, much more interested in this fact. 58% uh, of the watersheds in Green Lake County and 40% is in Fond du Lac County. So let's say Green Lake County got its act together and really dedicated the coordinating time and resources, which it's doing, to solve some of the problems of phosphorus loading in Green Lake, right? Work with farmers in a constructive fashion and bring people to the table, which is not easy because there are wealthy people around Green Lake. And I can tell you the other people who live in the watershed are below the U.S. mean uh, in uh, per capita income. So that's a cross-class conversation. But what if you got 60% in gear? There'd be 40% that is really focusing elsewhere. I mean, Fond du Lac County has a tiny stake in Green Lake. It's much more worried about what, what, floods, what, what flows east. Winnebago and, and the lakes in the east. And, they, and there's limited resources to move around. So you have a political geographic puzzle. How do you get the counties to coordinate? And the counties are coordinating. I want to credit everybody in this partnership. What does the UW do in this, very briefly? One, we've created a Green, uh, Green Lake Watershed Information System that gathers um, data from around the state. But I think what's more interesting is that we're studying two of the estuaries that are the main estuaries here um, on the uh, east and west side, which include the Silver Creek Estuary and the County Cane Marsh. And, you know, monthly water samples are taken. We work with the DNR or whatever else. But what's interesting about this is this. One system is macrophyte dominated. The other is algae dominated. They're two really different wetlands, estuary marshes, and they perform really differently, which allows you to compare, for example, how much phosphorus is flowing out of one system versus the other, which matters enormously, especially because a lot of that phosphorus is legacy phosphorus that was put there starting in the 1800s. Don't say anything you do today doesn't matter for the future. Farmers in the 1900 are creating, right now, part of the phosphorus loading in these lakes. Um, so this allows both a scientific experiment, but also a restoration opportunity, because if you work on removing those sediments and getting the, assuming we, we understand how they work, the algae-dominated system to perform a little more like the, the macrophyte system, you actually can lower the phosphorus loading in Green Lake and get towards your goals, which is a healthy lake system. All right, so Green Lake's really interesting. I can tell you more and more about it. There's a terrific investment in it up there by the UW-Madison. Um, a lot of the investments by UW-Madison come through the Water Resource Management Graduate Program. Are there any graduates of WRM in the room? All right. How does WRM work? And I just want to come back to this. It's a node and network approach. It produces decision-ready science, and it educates people by using community priorities first. Communities, watersheds, and counties come to the university and say, here are our problems and our research questions. We're too busy, and we don't have the way to solve. We take interdisciplinary groups of students at the graduate level, they come from engineering and they come from policy, they come together to try to study those problems and produce decision-ready results back to those communities within on a one-year rotating basis, time after time. It's more than 50 years old. There's a map of all of the, include, did not including the work that was done in Louisiana, of all the uh, WRN projects around the state, many of them were in the Yahara watershed, and they've been incredibly productive. The current ones are really interesting. There's Beaver Dam. Anybody here living around the Beaver Dam watershed? This watershed, this is a hot mess. This is like the example of everything that can go wrong in an ecosystem. I don't want to go into detail, but part of what WRM is studying is how serious are the problems and what levers can you pull on to remediate the system. Whereas, that was 2016, whereas 
The Wabisa weapons are like, well, they're perfect. Why would you bother studying them? <laughs> because as development rolls in and agricultural systems change in the region, this very well protected and very well studied uh, system is at perilous risk of, this is, a, this is the gem of this region, by the way. Go, go there now. I've learned the Clean Lakes lesson. If you go there, you will be committed to saving them. And they don't appear at risk now, but I can tell you that the city of Dunn, the town of Dunn, Dane County, and the city of Fitchburg are very interested in the outcome. In our 2017 practicum, a bunch of students, smart people dedicated to characterizing ecosystem services to show how expensive it would be to lose this system. What do you lose ecologically? What do you lose in function? What do you lose in terms of the services it provides to the local economy? Right? Interdisciplinary, economics, phenology, restoration science. Yes? Okay. I did have something to say here, but I'm running out of time. About, if I, I probably lost five minutes to this. About Yahara 2070, I think you just should bring, Chris, has Chris Kuchar, Kuchar, Kuchar come in to speak about this? Yeah, bring Chris in. The idea here is to envision the future, imagine what ways that the, uh, this, this region will move forward, various scenarios, and then model what happens to various kinds of ecosystems. And under various scenarios, you get different kinds of water quality or clarity. This is all what was done before 2009. Well, done in the early 2000s. But then, of course, if you layer the decline of Daphne on it, you get to see changes in the system. This is the advantage, advantages of modeling. I never liked modeling, now I love it. Um, this really opens your eyes. This is an interdisciplinary plan, let me tell you. To understand every ecosystem service is huge. I'm going to close with climate change. You've got like 10 minutes before we go to questions, so you can. We'll start questions at like 8.50. No, 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 no. Questions. I can't answer any of these questions because none of this is my research. <laughs> I cannot close without the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, which I still consider the most important key or piece of the puzzle for lakes restoration and protection in this state. Um, it is a bit of an orphanage program, I'm here to tell you. It's one that was created from the entire campus. The entire campus came forward. It's housed in the Nelson Institute and the Center for Climatic Research, but it is truly a cross-campus enterprise. There are people from economics, there are people from zoology, there are obviously the limnologists and all the water people, but it is one of the great, one of the few examples of the whole campus rising up to ask and answer some fundamental questions being presented to them by communities. Oh, look who's here. Hi. You should get up and talk about Wiki. I feel really bad. Tell me if I get something wrong. All questions to you. Okay. This is a, and, and, and coming out of it are a series of reports, and these reports and workshops are not based around the campus coming up with ideas and then dumping them on the public, right? These workshops, like with the city of La Crosse, are about how do we move forward in planning for climate change. And I think if we're not going to ask questions about clean lakes, I think we better build in what's coming out of the wiki. Because what's coming out of the, the climate change research is pretty startling. Let's go here. So I, I didn't present the historical data here, but all the things you see pro projected forward are based on historical the historical trends are all in this direction. So we, what they've done is they downscaled climate change data to, to decision-ready resolution. Because if you try to use traditional climate change data, there are these big pixels. How big a pixel are they from traditional climate models? The size of the state, right? So a global climate model chunks out like this is how the precipitation is going to go ahead, and you get a square and you overlay it on the state of Wisconsin. That is useless to the city of Fitchburg, right? So you've got to do a lot of math. You downscale those models with high precision based on data that exists around the state of Wisconsin because, bless the state of Wisconsin, this state is one of the best monitoring states for, for temperature, precipitation, water quality that I've ever worked in. The resolution of this data is, if it could, if it had to happen somewhere, it was going to happen in Wisconsin. Wiki was the first. States around the country are now rolling out pro, uh, pro, programs very much like this. Let's take a look. This is projected change in precipitation. So winter precipitation, early spring, up to 40% wetter. These things are going to come, I might add, in high volume events over short periods. So more high intensity rainfall events. And then longer periods, right? High amplitude, low frequency event, or medium frequency events. So there'll be dry periods, interspersed. What a mess to plan in. Why do you care? You care? No. Oh, no. Please stick with this. because of the recharge problem that I just described before. Anything that happens on the surface, we talked a little bit about how what happens under the ground affects the surface. Well, anything that happens on the surface 
affects what goes on underground. So high levels of precipitation and high intensity events means a rising water table, and where you do not have communities that are disinfecting their systems, you're going to wind up with sludge in the streets. Sludge. Toxic sludge. And this, what's true? That, that's not an overstatement. That's, that's spring green in 2008. Spring green again and again and again. So I think trying to build in this climate change into the projections that Clean Lake Alliance is trying to do is essential because we're, we're hitting moving targets. Let's keep going. Change in Wisconsin's average temperature between 1950 and 2006. Winters have warmed more than any other seasons in recent decades in the winter. That's where you're seeing the, uh, the winter. Can somebody point to me where the Berkey is? It's like up here somewhere. Huh? Sawyer County. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay, good luck with that. Um, why do we care? All right, leaving aside um, that, you care because of the temperature of trout streams is enormously sensitive to the ambient temperature in the system. So your temperature in the trout stream can rise just a degree, and you've lost an incredible value. Your trout streams are now essentially less productive. In fact, wiki is essentially an effort in triage. The southern parts of the state may have trout streams, not in the unglaciated zone, which is com complicated because of its topography, but in some of these other areas, they may be a lost cause. The ones up north are probably north, far enough north, farther, farthest enough north, that they're not as sensitive to those kinds of changes. Now you have a belt of trout streams in the center of the state, depending on, 9 degrees is not out of uh, the range of possibility, but let's just say 1.8. You've got a series of trout streams that you can mediate, you can meander, you can shade in through vegetation. The DNR can handle this problem because you have higher precision in where your decision making is around the water resource relative to the climate. Last case example. Last case example. Projected change in seasonal temperatures. Again, fall. This is the winter. There's the murky again. I think this is where people live. This is the famous John Magnuson graph of. Uh, ice cover on Lake Mendota. Who has seen this before? This is like textbook 101. It's a beautiful <laughs> data set. It also shows how, how long we've been collecting data. I really want to commend the people of Wisconsin. This is ice on and ice off dates, so or time period, right? The length of time that ice spends on Lake Mendota between 1850 and the early 2000s. And what you can see is that the 10 longest periods, take a look at that, 180 days of ice. Try to think about that. That must have been one hell of a winter. <laughs> the late 1800s, the 10 shortest uh, are spread across the 20th century, and these last couple of years are not even on the graph. When you show people that, when you talk about trout streams, when you ask people what it is they value, then they will come to the university and they will ask for science. If you tell them that we do a lot of really great science, they will tell you that Madison is a bunch of time-wasting, lazy faculty elitists. So if you, they're not right, but that's how we feel. I think that's fair to feel that way. Not because it's true, but because it's fair to feel. So <laughs> my point here is that if you start with what people value, you build the nodes of excellence by investing in the education and the research. And the university takes the time and investment to build networks between those nodes to solve and, and answer the questions that are asked by communities. This university is going to continue to thrive in the 21st century. If it does anything less than that, it's going to be, you know, uh, Indiana, <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, all right. Uh, you see my point. This is a top five research uh, institution, and it got here a different way than the other top five. It's now a top six research university. But it got here a different way than everybody else. It got here this way. That's what the University of Wisconsin did. And it did it probably if I had to name the place it did it best, and it did it first. I'd say it's water, and that was my message for today, and I'm all done. We've got about uh, 10, 15 minutes, about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, anybody uh, all the way in the back? Somebody gets willing to pay for it. So nothing exists on this campus unless it has staff. 
for that part. And I don't mean faculty. Faculty can be great, but this kind of work takes super smart academic staff, often PhD holding, sometimes postdocs. I'm giving you a really blunt answer. That is what the network has to be invested in. We have a tendency to invest in nodes. When we invest in networks, you see what we get. So I honestly think what UW's problem is that it isn't staff. Wisconsin Ecology is an interesting example as well. It does a, it's a little higher profile. Maybe you haven't heard of that either. Yeah, OK, why? It's got staff. Very few. So my, my answer to your question is kind of, is, I know, spend more money, right? It's not about spending more money. It's about making commitments to the network even as you invest in the nodes. So is there a communication problem? Sure. But if you don't have anybody making the website, did you see that web? Did you see that slide? It was terrible. I didn't design it. Some, some graduate student, worse yet, some undergraduate probably did. I love our undergraduates. But, but I just, I'm trying to say that it's not just a communication problem, it's an investment problem. And you get communication when you invest in communication. And when you bring knowledgeable people like you back into the university to, to make that communication happen. Wiki, when it was thriving, when it was at its best, was investing close something in, in staffing. Smart people who understood how it worked and who could network the system. Um, but if there's no money in the network, you wind up with slides like that. Is that a fair answer? Yeah, and I think that uh, the lower grade the We're talking more invest in communication. I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah, not just throwing money at something. It's really about making sure you have the right people in the right place for the right commitment. Yeah, that's a university lesson that is learned unevenly. Yeah, for Do you know the answer? I couldn't agree more. So let me, answer, let me answer your question, because your question is, who should I talk to? And the answer is, uh, Ian Thompson and the water resource management students who just spent a good deal of time in that, in that space trying to work with managers to make more rational decisions. But if the community needs to communicate with the university, then you, you need, we, need, we need to set up a, some, some better mode of having a conversation about the community priorities. I couldn't agree more. So I talked to Anita. Almost every WRM practically starts with a stakeholder survey, but they didn't knock on your door. And if that's true, then we're not there yet.
Right. Let's take a look at the report, which should be coming out in the spring. Let's okay. take a look and see what it says. Go ahead. Well, you don't. And, but so what does that mean? It means that we have to think differently about who our constituency is. Because it's the constituency that will invest in the university. And I will tell you, this is where I'll say something stupid. Can I say something stupid? That the Institute, so far as I can tell, had a really great relationship with the DNR. To the point that it was a monoculture. Which is to say, you should never have a monoculture, whatever it is. Like, if you're only, if you have one constituent, one major constituent, that's footing a lot of the bill or some of the bill, and their priorities shift for whatever reasonable or unreasonable reason, you're going to wind up holding the bag. Now, if the private sector had been more closely involved, if there had been community investments, if we were to talk to our friends in insurance, in particular insurance, and real estate, I think we would have found, these are modest investments relative to American families' bottom line. I think that conversation should have happened a long time ago, because otherwise there's no money for the staff to do the networking and the communication. Uh, that is, the faculty should also be doing this. I'm not saying they shouldn't. And Wiki isn't gone, but I'd call it dormant, because it's looking for a customer. And that means at least in part a paying customer. Not everybody should pay, but those who can should, so that those who can't benefit from the university's science and research. So I'm not saying you only go to the highest bidder. We are not a consulting firm. But we are dependent on partnerships to make us work. And I do think that the failure of a specific partnership for a lot of complex historical reasons was something that somebody who studied resilience should have seen coming. So that's as controversial as I'm going to be. <laughs> uh, blame the victims. I think we didn't do a very good job of looking if my brothers and sisters in the private sector out here in the audience are interested in supporting the resilience of this community in the future, things like the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts are cheap investments with huge payoffs in terms of planning, land use planning, insuring. <coughs> Please. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Our relationship, UW's or Phoenix Alliance, our relationship with Wisconsin back to that everything's connected and economically you know I, I appreciate your slide about um, um, inspections and on groundwater but it's like well if you're not going to be able to get out into your fields to plow because it's underwater so all these things that are related and could be put in economic terms so the business-minded people who are members of WRC say hey be a part of this team because it's your bottom line that's going to you can't continue to um, achieve whatever it is you're manufacturing or producing with the, the changes that are happening. And I'll, I'll just point out, our, our cell is in Virginia. It had more snow than we have here. And I don't know if you heard that the entrance to the Hampton Roads was shut by the Coast Guard because of the storm out there. That was a quarter of a billion dollars in commerce in one day that was affected. So getting that message out there. The economic impacts of the changes that we're all experiencing, whatever you want to call it, it is going to affect you. You have to get. I just said yes. <laughs> um, but, I, but I do, so. But I do think that there's a tendency in my brothers and sisters in the green community, I am an environmentalist, to wag fingers instead of create invitations. And there's a way to set a tone for this conversation that I don't think we Job. So I do think that just coming up with the numbers, like this is how much money is at stake, is really different than starting the conversation with whatever those priorities are. Um, so any lesson we learned from lacrosse in Wiki could probably be extended to the insurance industry and, and our brothers and sisters in real estate and risk management more generally. It has to be an invitation. Okay? I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Dr. Adams, one more time. Awesome. Uh, a couple of quick announcements again before you leave. Everybody 
has one of these at their seat. It's uh, talking about frozen assets. And again, a great free family festival that will be right here at the Edgewater, February 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. If you're a fat biker, get out there on Friday night. It's an awesome event. Uh, a run Saturday morning, the first ever that we can think of that maybe doesn't touch land, uh, completely on the lake, uh, super cool. Also, it takes a huge army of volunteers to pull this off. Uh, and so there's a little stick around here if you'd like to volunteer to help us with the race or help greet people. Um, you'll get a nice fleece lands and hat, which is really nice. Um, Next month, February 14th, is our uh, Yara Lakes 101 Valentine's Day. And what could be more romantic than learning about the reproductive uh, uh, practices of fish in the lake? Uh, so we'll dim the lights, we'll have some Mary Whites, maybe some little chocolates. Uh, you'll learn a lot, uh, and you'll, you'll be fulfilled, I think. Uh, Justin Schenever from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources will be there, former intern of ours, former a contractor at Clean Lakes Alliance, so it should be a really interesting talk. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming out, and we'll see you next month.